I'm Peter Bois, nationally touring magician. And I'm Gus Davis, nationally touring game show host. We don't get regular Saturday nights because we are out performing on the weekends. That's why Mondays are so special to us. They are our Saturdays. We will help you get through your Monday by joining us on our Saturday. Monday is the new Saturday. Welcome Welcome to Monday Monday Club. Club. Oh yeah! What's up, all you Monday maniacs out there? This is Gus Davis. Along with me, as always, is Mr. Peter Bois, and we have a special guest this week. Mr. Nick Paul is joining us in the Monday Club Tree Fort. We are going to be talking about an instant regret shot that was taken with a small person and all of her tall friends. We're going to be talking about uh, talking to Nick and talking to him about all the awesome things that he's been up to and his amazing podcast. We're going to be talking about this week in the news. We're going to be talking about the Southwest Airlines flight and all that stuff that went down. And of course, this week's Teachable Moment. Stick around. It's going to be an awesome time. TGIM. TGIM, bros. What's up? Hey, it's Monday, finally. Oh, thank God. Thank God we got through this weekend, and now it's Monday. Uh, Hey, uh, we have a special guest on this show. Uh, Let's do a quick Monday Club cheers right here and right now uh, to Nick Paul joining us in the studio. Hey, Nick. Hi. Hello. How are you? Good, man. Awesome, How are you doing? Good. I'm just enjoying coffee in this lovely uh, California morning in my uh, room without a window. That's good. (laughs) <laughs> nice. Well, we uh, we want to say thank you very much to Nick for joining us. Uh, he's in the complete opposite time zone as Pete. So Pete's had most of his day. He's gone out. He's he's taking a nap already. It's like it's like late afternoon, and uh, Nick, it's like still morning time for you. So again, buddy, thanks for joining us this this week. For sure. Thanks for having me. Are you hating on so- my mid morning nap? No, dude, no. It's Monday. You should do whatever the hell you want to do. Hey, uh, so we have a cheers of the week for all of you Monday clubbers out there. Uh, Pete, do you want to take this one, dude? Yeah, Gus, thank you for finding this. You made my day with this little video. <laughs> so uh, this is instant regret shots. Instant regret. Shots <laughs> yeah. with tall people. So if you've ever been uh, to a ski town, a ski lodge, they have this thing where you put shots on a on a ski a long ski, and then you can do uh, like line four or five people up with shots across the ski, and you all tip uh, tip the ski to your mouth with the shot glass. Am I describing it terribly? Up to your no, mouth, you got it. and then you all take the shot at the exact same time. Uh, and apparently, it's kind of like a team building exercise. Yeah, yeah. If you can, it's like a trust fall sort of, but. <laughs> Without the falling and trusting. <laughs> and so there's three dudes. You're, they're about, you know, five, ten, six feet maybe. And then there's right. this uh, this girl. Uh, <laughs> just keep watching it over and over. Uh, this girl, she's probably, what, five, four, five, five uh, yeah. in the middle. And and they go and pick up and do this shot. And the instead of the shot going to her mouth, the shot goes basically to her forehead because she's too short. And the sh- <laughs> and it looks like Jaeger goes all over her face and chest <laughs> and hair, and she just takes it like a champ. Though she just closes her eyes and she knows, you know what? Uh, that was really stupid. I can't believe. Yeah, I this is happening. That. There's nothing I can do about this. I know they're going to be <laughs> talking shit about me for for a couple of years over this. <laughs> <laughs> the sad part is it is it's a gif and it just goes on forever and it's one of those things that'll probably live in the internet forever forever <laughs> yeah and and uh i think it gets funnier every time like the first time you watch it and you're like oh i feel bad for that person but the more it happens the more you see it in a loop the more you're like well that's that just gets funnier every single time yeah and her <laughs> reaction i think is the best too because it's just like you know when you've been when when something bad has happened, but <laughs> you're just There's taking it. You, you're just, it. you just yeah. accept accept the badness. Yeah. Uh, hey, Nick, did you ever see that uh, old Nickelodeon show uh, where they'd slimed you? I think it was Double Dare. Uh, yes, I was. I am a product of '90s Nickelodeon. Yeah, I, I thought you were, man. Uh, well, this is. I think we could bring it back and just do every time you mess up, uh, just pour Jaeger on people. That's true. <laughs> I feel like instead of slime, if the slime was alcoholic, it would be a much more fun show. 
It's a little bit more expensive. Nickelodeon didn't have much of a budget in the 90s. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's what I've heard. <laughs> my good friend, um, I just interviewed him on my podcast, Michael Rayner. His wife is Mo from Guts, uh-huh. and they're good friends of ours. And I've got to take, my wife and I got to take a photo with the aggro crag last summer because they just have it sitting in their home <laughs> office. And uh, it's pretty much the greatest day of my life. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Yeah, I actually just finished listening to that podcast, and I thought it was great, man. And that whole family oh, is thanks. a product of of, uh, of the nineties of the nineties Nickelodeon era. And uh, and I think you talked to them about, hey, none of these people got uh, super rich off of that, but that was some great experience and uh, some great flight time on TV. And and I think it's cool that so many people got to sort of bond over over such a such a like influential TV show and, 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 and TV program as, as old school Nickelodeon. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Why uh, have a th- thing of the past? Why yeah. haven't that they made that into an attraction at an amusement park? Right, you get to like run through the old Double Dare uh, obstacle course. I got. Well, I'd, they did it at Universal Orlando. They had a live action Double Dare for a long time when Nickelodeon Studios was still what? shooting there. Um, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure I have photos of me and my family. Like, on, I don't think it was the actual set, but they definitely had a, uh, a an attraction of sorts that you could do. That. Oh, oh man, I can't believe I God. missed that. It's so funny because <laughs> yeah. ne- now incredible. it seems like everything that's ha- like all of the all of the media that's out there is trying to capture that specific demographic uh, that grew up in the '90s and be like, "Hey, remember when you were a kid and how much magic there was on TV and in the world? Let's recreate that." But where you give us money. So, like, as attractions to Universal, bringing back Transformers, bringing back Ninja Turtles, like, all of those things. Just, like, hey, let's, uh, let's, let's milk this a little bit more. I'm sure we can get some more money. I would. That, that's Nostalgia it. makes money. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely would. Well, let's cheers to uh, instant regret shots with tall people. This, uh, this chick who is taking a shot with tall people. Uh, I'm sure she's learned her lesson just... Sh- take shots with short people like herself. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's right. Must be this tall to take a shot. <laughs> but thanks to the laugh, short girl. Yeah, cheers. Cheers. Oh, my God. I'm, I'm going to slightly blame the short... Just just to, to go back to... I'm going to blame the short girl just a little bit because my wife is very short and she knows her, her height limitations. So <laughs> it, it is partially in this lady's fault. I'm, I'm not going to blame her 100%, but it is partially her fault. Uh, for not knowing i'm with that nick how old how uh how tall are you i am 511 i think yeah 511 okay it, like roughly six feet right pete how tall are you i am pretty much exactly six feet okay yeah i'm in the six feet club i'm about six one uh and and i agree with you nick i think that when you're uh, whatever height you are you know your limits like for me, I have a sixth sense about how high I can lift my arms when I'm under a ceiling fan. Like I don't have to, you know what I'm saying? Like I don't have to <laughs> have to look around. I, I, I just want to know. know how much time you've spent underneath a ceiling fan like, to learn this lesson. <laughs> look, I, I had some real small apartments growing up, man. <laughs> That's true. I live in L.A. I understand. But yeah, this. man. Uh, so, so yeah, I'm with you. I think that I think that short people. Probably have that same awareness as to, as to their height, and I'm sure as soon as the ski went up, she was like, "Oh damn, I'm in the wrong place." Yep, that's on me. <laughs> I, I messed up. <laughs> well, uh, Pete, dude, what are you drinking, buddy? Today is a good day. This is the first day I saw. It means summer's summer's like right around the corner for us New Englanders up here. Uh, Sam Summer uh, has their summer ale in store. And so that means nice. summer is right around the corner. It uh, I like to drink Sam se- around the seasons, and uh, I love uh, having a Sam summer. And I even barbecued last night and had what? had one of these. It was amazing. It was like 50 degrees yesterday. So we had our shorts out and uh, <laughs> T-shirts, and we were throwing the, uh, the volleyball around. It was great. <laughs> oh, dude, that sounds awesome. I thought it was still, like, snowing in Maine. Um, not in my part. Okay. It's, all right, it snowed cool. a couple weeks ago, but it's all gone around my house. <laughs> God damn. Hey, my was... family's from Detroit, and like literally every other day, it's either snowing or it's like it's eighty degrees today, and I, I can't keep up because yeah. the weather just is terrible. It's like yeah, the wheel Austin, of weather. 
You yeah, just... here in Austin, it's been crazy. It's been it's like snowed three times this winter, which it never it it barely ever snows ever in Austin. So that was insane. And then it keeps fluctuating from being in the 90s to being in the low 50s. And so I'm sure everybody here is about to get sick. There, I saw June bugs out in April. Like trees have like flowered and then lost all their leaves. Like they don't know what the hell's going on. It's it's <laughs> nuts around here. Uh, uh, what you... Nick, what what are you drinking, man? Um, I got some Pete's coffee that I just brewed in a Club 33 mug from Walt Disneyland. Um, you have to be, know somebody to get this mug, you know, it costs lots of handshakes. So <laughs> nice. It's, uh, I'm drinking, it's a, a tequila sunrise. It's a orange juice and tequila. I've got this, uh, uh, Blanco tequila. It's a, uh, it's from Altos. It's very good. Uh, and then as a sidecar, I got a, I got the last of my IPAs from Eric Diddleman. So, uh, so I'm, I got you. I got you, Nick. I'll, this take, I'll si- take it on nice. board. This sidecar is otherwise known as I need to drink something else with this IPA so I don't throw up. That's kind of right. Yeah, I, hate, I freaking hate IPAs, uh, as as you know, Diddleman, yeah. if you're listening, buddy. Uh, all right, well, cool, man. Well. Uh, uh, Nick, again, can't thank you enough for joining us. We're going to get to talk to Nick in just a second. But, Nick, cheers, buddy. Cheers. Cheers. Well, Everybody thank you guys so much name. for listening to Monday Club. We appreciate you being part of the club. Make sure you tell a friend about Monday Club. Uh, let us let them know what we're up to here so they can come hang out in the Monday Club clubhouse with us. Uh, check us out on our website, mondayclubpodcast.com. Sign up for the newsletter there. We are putting up exclusive content just uh, for the newsletter sign uppers. Is that a word? Sign uppers? It is now. So check that out. Sign up on the website. And uh, if you want to buy us a drink, you know what? You could totally like come to our house and deliver a, a six pack of your favorite beverage or mix us a drink if you want. Or you know what? There is the internet. You can always PayPal us anytime. Monday Club Podcast at gmail.com and let us know what you want us to drink. Your favorite drink, your, you know, your most interesting drink, whatever, favorite beer. Uh, let us know what it is. We'll go out, buy it, give you a shout out on air. And it's uh, Follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Twitter is Monday Club Pod, Instagram Monday Club Podcast, and we're on Spotify and YouTube if uh, you prefer those. So thanks for being part of the club, and uh, we love you all. Yeah, we totally love you all. Well, speaking of love, uh, let's welcome our guest this week. Uh, so uh, our guest this week has been on cruise ships. You've toured all around the world. You've been uh, you've been a magician at Disney World. Uh, I got to see one of your recorded performances uh, at the. Uh, at the Magic Castle in Hollywood. I know that you performed at the the House of Magic in Macau in China. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, three, and of three months of my life. And of course, you uh, are now here on on Monday Club, which I'm sure you'll add to your trophy case right there, uh, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> this is uh, Nick this Paul. is going right at the top. <laughs> Thank you. I love that you have a sound effect that just made my day. <laughs> We've got more depending on what happens next, so don't worry. I wanted to do – me and a buddy of mine wanted to do a bit in my show where he just is on the side of the stage with, like, one of those sound effect um, pianos. And just throughout the whole show, he does terrible sound effects to whatever I'm doing. But we could never get it to work. But we always thought it was the funniest thing in the world. I think <laughs> – So well, thank you. Oh, thank you for that. Oh, you're very welcome. The well-placed sound effect can make or break a, make a moment, you know? Yeah, uh, it's true. When I first got started in Magic, Nick, I got started working uh, tech for uh, a who, the guy who's now my business partner, CJ Johnson. He toured around doing uh, an illusion show, and uh, when he first got started, he had a like a was it a MIDI player like with the the the, the micro mm-hmm. discs uh, with all of the different sound effects on it, and so you'd have to be backstage, and for all of the sound effect cues, you'd have to hit the right combo of, of numbers super quick. So like one four is the laugh track or the or the bop sound or whatever. And uh, and I remember it was always a funny game for him and for anybody who was working tech that it was almost impossible to get it right the very first time. And so he'd be like a magic spin and a magic tap with his wand, and you'd hit a thing, and like the wedding march would start playing or some, <laughs> something crazy. And he'd just have to roll with it. He'd just have to improv with it. It. So uh, so yeah, sound effects great for for backstage. <laughs> That's awesome. That's so really funny, Nick. We don't know you that well, man. We've we've never really hung out in real life. 
We've we've had a couple of emails, and we so I guess we have. Where are you from? Like, are you from LA? Are you? Uh, I know you live there now. Um, no, I'm from uh, suburbs of Detroit. Lived in Chicago for many years. Went to college. Met my wife there. Then we moved down to Orlando. We became full time performers at Disney World. I was a magician. She uh, worked in shows and parades. And then in 2015, we moved out here to L.A., and we've been out here since, and it's good. Been going fun. Uh, having a good time. Uh, yeah. Nice, That's man. That's cool, man. Are you, are you both performers? Yeah, my wife is an actress and sketch writer, um, comedy writer, and she helps me out in the show sometimes. She helped me out at the Magic Castle last week. She was on stage with me, making sure certain magical tricks worked. <laughs> Without her, certain tricks wouldn't work. Um, uh-huh. And uh-huh. yeah, yeah, she went with me to House of Magic in Macau for three months, and she did over 240 shows with me in three, 13 weeks. And yeah, so she's been a very did helpful asset. 240 shows in 13 weeks, three months? Yeah, I was doing three to eight shows a day, um, five or six days a week. And if you're interested in hearing about the slow spin of madness of two magicians, <laughs> um, you can listen to my podcast, Two Magicians, One Mike. We did, I think, eight or nine episodes called The Macau Sessions, where uh-huh. we were just weekly documenting what was going through our brain, performing for Chinese audiences. And it starts off, like, the first episode is like, yay, this is fun. This is so exciting. And by probably the eighth episode, you just hear us go, oh, my God, I can't wait for this to be done. <laughs> um, what? So what was but, the uh, the big thing? Uh, could they they could speak English? Yeah, no? Or was it all um, yeah, foreign we had, speakers? It was – so because my show – a lot of what I do is physical comedy, nonverbal. Um, that's why they booked me because they were looking for more, like, nonverbal acts. So a lot of the audiences were Chinese or um, Thai or Japanese coming through. So not a lot of English. They knew a little bit of English, so you could sprinkle in things here and there. But they wanted primarily nonverbal acts. But um, performing for Chinese audiences was kind of a wake-up call because they're not used to, you know, we hear, we see a show, we know when to applaud, we know when to react. We are, we are conditioned to see entertainment uh, in the Western side of the world. And there, they're just kind of, I think, getting cert- our our version of live entertainment. So I had to learn how to be a little bit more of a showman, and to like extend my hands when I wanted applause, <laughs> or to like be a little bit more specific when I wanted to get a laugh out of people. And um, it was fun, but it was it was exhausting. And I came back a week later and did the Magic Castle, and my first show was just it was life changing because it's like, oh, thank God, English. You know, Western audiences, you know, they, they they understand this, but it was fun. But it was it was a lot of work. Well, let's uh, can we talk about that again real quick? Like the uh, the idea of because I've seen your I've seen your uh, your nonverbal act uh, online, and and I noticed that you are very expressive. Obviously, if you're doing a nonverbal act, you have to be very physical, very expressive, very motion with your hands and stuff like that. Did did that get bigger as you uh, experienced your uh, your audiences in China, would you say? Uh, a little bit, yeah. I mean, I'm trained in mime, so like one of the foundations in physical theater is just being very specific with your movements. And, I mean, that's not even with mime. It's just with anything on stage, um, any type of... Um, physicality on stage you want to be very specific so i had to in some cases get more specific or make it um slightly bigger or just right just to get my point across to 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 an audience that really (laughs) wasn't following what was going on were they were they getting the uh were they getting the magic out of it uh were they responding to that or was it there any like whoa or just it was very polite like sitting quietly um it just depended um there was a lot of people on their phones <laughs> there was a man who was texting in the back <laughs> and i and i like this is a businessman in the very back row of the theater and this it, the, the theater i was in fit about 150 people and i called him out i looked at him and i made a gesture with the phone made a joke out of it and then he puts the phone down and then there's a the part in the show where i'm blowing up a, a giant eight foot balloon and he gets up 
and I see that his phone is ringing. He gets up, walks in front of the stage, picks up the phone, starts talking as I'm, you know, inflating this huge balloon with a leaf blower, like the climax of the show. And he's looking at me as if I'm the crazy person and just walks out of the theater. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the uh, – that's – that's performing in China in a nutshell. <laughs> I love that line, inflating a huge balloon with a leaf blower. I don't know if you get any funnier than that. <laughs> There's no other way to do it. I've tried. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's that's crazy. So uh, so you're in L.A. now. Uh, what? Uh, how'd you get into magic? Are you a Christmas uh, magic kit magician, library magician? No. Well, I grew up in a weird family. My dad's a ventriloquist, um, <laughs> so I grew up around performers. And grew up around magicians, and then I saw David Copperfield on TV, and it was kind of surreal last night being at the uh, Magic Castle Awards. It was the first time I've ever went, and Copperfield was getting an award for Magician of the Decade, and it's like, oh, look, I'm a couple rows back. I'm like, hey, there's that guy that influenced my whole life. <laughs> right. <laughs> they didn't give and him, like, Magician was, of the Millennia yeah. or anything? <laughs> I feel like he's already gotten that. Yeah. So they yeah. just, like, made yeah. a new category. He got Magician of the Decade, and then they gave him some fellowship, which was – he literally walked off stage, and then Dick Van Dyke shows up and does an intro, and Copperfield comes back out on stage and gives another short speech. Just one of these, like, weird, surreal – like, two years ago, before I was living in L.A., I'd be like, oh, my God, this is amazing. But, like, going to the castle so often, you, you're – you're surrounded by celebrities and you see these things on a regular basis where in a weird way it's becoming normal and it's not, but like my brain is rationalizing it more than before I had lived in LA. Cause this, this stuff just never happened, but right. it's LA. That's weird stuff like this happens on a day. Like Dick Van Dyke, he's a magic castle member. He, he shows up, you know, a couple times a month. That's just, that's what happens. <laughs> that's, <laughs> Dude, that's awesome though. Yeah. That yeah, does not happen really, in Maine. Really awesome. Don't go down to the local <laughs> club and and see and see Dick Van Dyke stroll in. Even yeah, I I mean when I live in Orlando, yes, yeah, same. And even Chicago, which they they do a lot of filming and theater stuff. You know, I would you would rarely see celebrities in Chicago, and here it's just they're around every street corner. <laughs> Is that awesome. one of the reasons why you moved to L.A. was to try to be uh, in in that in that circle in that crowd? Um, yeah, my wife wanted to come out here. It was more her idea. She wanted to come out here and really, because we were both majored in theater and we were both kind of just like hit our, our point performing at Disney World where it was like, this is fun, but we don't really see it going anywhere else. Um, so she wanted to come out here and pr pursue acting full time, which is, she's been being pretty successful at that. And I'm like, okay, I'll take this as an opportunity to really get to know the magic community out here. And I got to say, it's been, they've been very, it, they've, um, a great community out here. They very, they embrace you wholeheartedly. There's not a lot of, um, in other cities I've lived in, there's like a lot of like territorialness, you uh -huh. know, that's, Hey, that's my gig or that's mine or, um, and it's not that much. There's just so many magicians out here that it kind of just fades away and everybody's for the most part in it together and, you know, very collaborative and, you know, if you have an idea, if I'm working on something new, I'll, I'll text three of my buddies and go, hey, what do you think of this? And, you know, nobody's going to, like, steal it or right. add it to their show. They're going right. to, you know, basically be a director for you. And that was probably the biggest surprise about moving out in L.A. Because you hear there, there's a lot of – certainly a lot of snootiness and a lot of, you know, West Hollywoodness, um, the typical, uh, I don't know, things you hear about L.A. But there's also – a, a wonderful community of um, magicians and people and comedians and whatnot out here. And um, it's been good. It's been a good, uh, a pleasant surprise, I should say. Dude, that's awesome, man. Uh, it's so interesting, different people's experiences uh, based on their geography as to where they've made their, you know, put down their, their stakes to, to, to live and to work. Um, we were talking with uh, Nate Staniforth, who grew up in Iowa City, Iowa, and up until he was a well-established pro, hadn't really gotten a chance to see or work with any other magicians. And so when he got out and, and started meeting other magicians, it was sort of – it was surreal to see other people that were out there doing their own thing. And then – you flip that to people who live in Vegas, who I think a lot of people who live in Vegas have had the experience of they've got to be very close to the chest with all of the work that they're trying to produce uh, just because of the nature of the beast of living in Vegas. And then it's interesting sure. to hear 
that in it, at least to your experience in LA, uh, there's kind of like a hey, we're all in this together. If you have an idea, that's cool. Yeah, there's I I'm a firm believer in surrounding yourself with. Um, in whatever field you're in, you know, in our case, entertainment, um, surrounding yourself with people that are better than you because it forces you to work harder and it, um, you just see where the bar is set. Um, and it can get kind of depressing sometimes. I'll, I'll go see shows at the castle <laughs> weekly and I'll see a show and go, hey, I quit. I'm done with this. I'll, I'll never be as good as that. But, you know, it, like I said, it sets a bar and it, it, it pushes you just to keep getting better and, um, you can, never really um coast out here you uh-huh. know if you do it kind of goes away quickly yeah that's true the more the more uh more people you put in one spot that do the same thing is the competition level increases immensely mm-hmm. yeah. yeah yeah that's why i live in maine <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm full of the maine jokes today this is great <laughs> king of kinabunkport <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, tell me about tell me about your podcast about uh, the two magicians one mic. How did that get started? Um, I started that in 2012 as like a side project, and I've done it on and off. And now I've been doing it. It's a monthly episode just because that's as much effort as I can put into it between that and right. traveling and you know promoting myself. But it's it's one of those things that I keep like trying to stop doing. And then I'll look at the downloads and I'm like, Oh, people enjoy this. Like our Macau sessions thing. I still get messages we did that a year ago and I'll get messages from people going, Hey, this is amazing. Um, you know, cruise ship entertainers going, I've listened to every episode because you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by what you guys went through. So, um, it's kind of similar to what you guys are doing too. And just talking about entertainment, we, we talk a little bit about magic, but it's really just, dissect i'm I'm fascinated by the theory of entertainment and dissecting it from the performance perspective and figuring out what works and what doesn't and how people process you know this job because i think a lot of us are solo performers on the road and it can get kind of lonely out there and if you're if you're able to connect with other people on a, um, a similar level um I don't know. There, there's just something there, and it's just fascinating to me. So that's why I kind of keep doing it. Cool, that's man. Cool. Uh, what it, it from all of the interviews that you've done, and I got a chance to listen to a, a couple of episodes of your of your podcast. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I like the I like the kind of just the like you said. It it feels a lot like this one where it's it's very low key, and it's like, hey, I just want to get to know you and, and get your get your opinions about things. Uh, from all the all of the interviews that you've done, do you think that there's like, do you think that magic in and of itself is the drive that drives people or, or that makes people better? Or do you think that, like, uh, uh, coming at it from a lot of different angles, like uh, comedy, uh, you said you had a background in mime, juggling, uh, balloon animals, like like all of those different variety entertainments, do you think that those, those make a, a really solid magician specifically? Um, yeah, for, I don't, I, I look at magic as like a, a, an instrument, you know, like if you're a guitar player, guitar is the instrument and then you can use it how you want. Um, for me, I have a background in improv and sketch comedy. So that's kind of what I draw from when I'm writing new stuff. Um, I'm more interested in, I, one of my favorite quotes from, is from Doc East and a great bar magician. He's actually at the castle this week performing and his, quote is you know they don't remember what you did they remember how you made them feel and i find that's true you know i'll i'll run into people that saw me years ago and i could literally be doing the same routine or same version of a routine and they won't remember that they'll just remember how much they enjoyed the show so that's always the goal is to make people feel good and magic um can be used for that for that purpose um in the same way stand-up can in the same way sketch can same way drama can you know you just want to kind of it goes back to what copperfield always says you know just you want to transcend people's expectations and you want to just make them dream for a bit or or make them kind of forget their problems i don't know it's this is getting kind of too deep but (laughs) i think magic is a tool that can be used in many different ways 
So that that's kind of how I see it. Um, and other guys I know have okay. different – guys I've interviewed have different opinions about that. So I totally agree with you because whenever I talk to somebody after the show, they are always like, hey, we saw some guy at this casino or on this cruise ship when we we're on vacation or here or there. And I'm like, oh, cool. What's their name? And then they're like, oh, yeah. I don't know. It's a good show though. Know. <laughs> yeah. They don't yeah. remember you. They remember how you make them feel. <laughs> totally. Uh, dude, I remember yeah. one of the most freeing things for me when I was uh, uh, performing – uh, uh, magic shows. I, every year, I performed at this one uh, one event center, and every year for like three years, I tried to give them a different show. So I like the first year I did my A stuff. The second year, I remember I worked hard to come up with some new bits, some new routines, and and really make the entire show feel different. Third year, I tried to do some mix and match, and the fourth year, I was like, I I just ran out of time. Like I didn't have time to come up with anything new, and I did. My the very first set of show, like the very first show I had ever done for them, I did it basically word for word. I was like, "This is my standard. This is all my go-to stuff. This is this is this is me." And I remember that they told me that that was their favorite show of all time. And I was like, "I mean, really, it was the same stuff." Wait a minute, I shouldn't say that to you. <laughs> like, like, I was like, I was like, I was like, good. I'm glad you enjoyed it. It was, it was, and they were like, "Man, that was," so, and they just they just kept saying it over and over again. And I realized. It's not like they cared. They didn't. They didn't remember my set list. They didn't have access to my show notes. They didn't have access to any of that stuff. All they cared about is exactly what you were saying, Nick. They cared about the feeling that that they walked away with. And instead of me trying so hard, and I'm not trying to say be lazy, but I'm just saying like instead of me processing it all up in my head, do the best you can for them. It. it I've watched The Princess Bride probably 80 times in my life. It's not like that movie's changed. It's still a good movie. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, so yeah, uh, I think I think that that's a that's a really strong piece of advice for anybody listening. Is sh- is remember that feeling that you're leaving them with. You should have came back, uh, Gus. Sure. With uh, yeah, that's kind of my business uh, my business angle. You know, I do my uh, B and C and D material, and then just hope that they have me back for the fourth year so I can kill it. <laughs> <laughs> I just sing them. That's right. It's it's a terrible business model, but it's you know when it works, man. It sure makes you feel like you've gotten better. People are like, man, you have gotten so much better. Wow. <laughs> I will say it was like that for a long time, and then I started working cruise ships a couple of years ago, and you have to have two different forty fives, and so it's like. All right, I'm really proud of my A show, but my B show is kind of meh. But it's it's been a good kick in the butt because it it forces you to work on that new material and to make it work because you 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 live or die by the reviews of the audience and the reviews of the cruise director. So it kind of goes the yeah. opposite of what we were just yeah. talking about. But um, it's good not to get too comfortable with your your stuff too. They actually give you feedback. I've never done a cruise ship in my life. They actually review the audience has like a comment card on the performer. Or some electronic version of that? Yeah, a lot of ships, that's the case. Um, and the cruise director sends in a report at the end, you know, whether or not they liked it, what what worked, what didn't. Um, and, yeah, I've gotten I've gotten good reviews and I've gotten not so good reviews. And it just all depends on the cruise director and it all depends <laughs> on how that show goes. Yeah. Um, and it's I'm, I'm, I've only been doing ships since 2015 and I'm still relatively new to it. So I'm just now feeling comfortable. Like my wife and I got off a ship on Wednesday and that's probably the second time I've gotten off and went, okay, I, I, I see how this works. You know, I'm getting the hang of it, but still like we got a call at 7:45 PM because if to do a repeat show of my family show at 8 30 PM, because one of the dancers got injured and then the under understudy in the Broadway show also got injured. So the cr- assistant cruise director calls me in a panic and goes, uh, can you do another show right now? <laughs> and I was like, well, all right, we just got done with dinner and all my props are packed away because we're leaving tomorrow, but sure. And if I were to say no, you know, it would come back poorly on my report. So right. like, I literally had no choice but to say yes. But of course, I'm going to help them out because that's it's in the contract. That's what you sign up to do. Right. But it's just it's just a whole different beast on cruise ships. Uh, what would he have said if, well, would you like to see my five drinks in show or no show at all? <laughs> <laughs> Dinner was really good tonight. <laughs> <laughs> like I never because I had to do an adult show that night at 1030 oh, okay. but I yeah. still had some time and I never eat a big meal before shows I just can't but in this case I was like you know it's our last night on the cruise I'm gonna eat a nice big steak uh, at 730 and sure enough we get the call at 745 hey can you do another show 
<laughs> what? I'm like running around with a full stomach, which is the worst thing for me. <laughs> well, talk about that for uh, for cruise ships, for anybody listening, whether they're interested in cruise ships or whether they're interested in just, I don't know, being a, being a team player, I guess. Uh, uh, I think that that's a really important aspect of it. You said something like, well, that's just part of what we signed up for. I, Technically, yes. I think there's a lot of people who are out there who've been doing it for a really long time. When, when you do anything for a long time, I think you get jaded. And so I, I know that there are people out there who'd be like, ah, it's not you – know, you could have said no. You really could have said no. Uh, but on a cruise ship and in a lot of other performing situations, I think that you're in the spot where you have to – everybody's got to pull pull weight, and you got to pull extra weight sometimes. What, what other – what, what kind of led you to that? that experience of hey like hey we just got to do what we got to do how did how did that happen how did you how did you get into well i learned the first time i did princess cruises and i've only done a handful and they haven't had me back and it's probably because of this but <laughs> um they had me doing a 45 minute theater show and then another 30 minute family show so that's almost your two 45 minutes you know so i really only had another 15 20 minutes of material i could have done at that time that was two years ago. Now I have a little bit more. I do more close-up projection stuff, so I have more material. But the cruise director is like, hey, can you do another 45-minute adult show? Um, and I was kind of thrown by it, and I go, I can? I was just honest with her. I'm like, I can? I really don't want to because I'm already doing all this material, but if you need it, sure. And she's like, oh, okay, no, no problem. That's fine. And then it comes back a week later on the report to my agent that I didn't have enough material, even though I was already doing all this material and she wanted extra. Uh -huh. So I just learned that just say yes. And I mean, I have, like I said, a background in improv and it's amazing how much of those yes and lessons you learn in yeah. class apply to real life, especially on cruise ships. Just whatever they want, keep your head down, do it. Because it's, it's like you said, it's what you sign up for in ships. And I mean, I can, I know a lot of people that, disagree with that and i was like that for a long time but you know if you want to keep working you just have to be like you said a team player right no right. i hear you oh cool yeah i hear you well yes and let's talk some news this week in the news ladies and gentlemen our favorite airline is killing people. Um, so, <laughs> whoa, buddy, whoa, whoa! <laughs> Southwest Airlines, not on purpose. Yeah, not on right. purpose. We think uh, uh, an engine blew on a South en uh, West flight. I don't know where they were going from Pittsburgh, I think, to Dallas, Texas, and they landed in Philadelphia as an emergency landing. And engine blew up, uh, blew out a window, and some woman got sucked halfway through the window. They pulled her back. Uh, unfortunately, she died. Very tragic. Uh, that's crazy. And uh, and yeah, I fly Southwest. I know Gus, you fly Southwest. Nick, are almost you almost exclusively? Yeah, I fly like ninety nine percent Southwest unless I can't find a, a right flight there. Nick, uh, you you travel a lot. Where are your uh, airline loyalties? Um, when I book it myself, definitely Southwest. We got a companion pass. I got the credit card. They give you two free check bags for credit. There you go. Yep. You got to fly Southwest. Yep, 50-pound check no bags. No other there airline you go. does that. And you get to sit where you want. It, the yeah. seating system is amazing. Like Yeah, so this seat, you, you, you mentioned you get to pick where you seat. The seat she was sitting in was in 17, window seat. And mm -hmm. years ago, that used to be my seat. It would used to be right behind the the. Uh, the the wing, and I always pick the window because, you know, you don't want to be bothered and you want to fall asleep on flights, and that used to be my seat. Years ago, I changed it up. Now, I'm row 10 on the smaller planes, row 12, right in front of the wing, and uh, I had big second thoughts this last week when I was flying about which, if I was going to take an aisle seat... <laughs> Or a window seat. <laughs> yeah, no, man. Uh, I'm always. I I was like you, Pete. I was either 17, 19, or twenty one uh, for the uh, right by the window for the sole purpose that when you uh, when you sit in the window seat there, the windows aren't equally spaced on the airlines, and so if you pick one of those seats, you're far enough back that you have time to put your stuff in the overhead, but you also uh, when you are in that window seat. 
the window isn't exactly by your head. It's a slightly forward, sort of by your shoulders. So it gives you a little bit of extra so- shoulder room yeah, when you're a tall yeah. guy like us. Yeah, yeah that's exactly <laughs> my thought process. I want that little <laughs> that little nook in the window so I can yeah. stuff my pillow in there and you know yeah. get that extra room in there. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, uh, so yeah. Man. I'm not terribly. I'm not terribly worried about this because I forget which Malcolm Gladwell book it is, but he discusses like what has to happen for a plane to go down. And it's literally like seven different things have to fail. And in this case, it was the engine, which seems like the most important thing. <laughs> but it's it's not going to happen again for a while. And I, I if anything, it's just going to make flying safer. So, I mean, it, it's terrible that they lost somebody lost their life it really is and it's you know it's just tragic but it's it's one of those things that ultimately will make plane travel make yeah traveling on planes safer the faa uh, has ordered like what 40 or 60 planes southwest planes to be rechecked their engines and everything so pretty much like next week will be the safest time to fly southwest ever Right, sure. Right, right. right. And I got, well, I got two Southwest flights coming yeah. up. I'm, I'm looking forward to those. Oh, right. And, you know, one of the things I think is important to talk about with, uh, with any tragedy like this, uh, uh, air, airline crash, and, and not to trivialize or take away from the tragedy of a woman losing her life. That is truly terrible. I think anyone with a heart can can understand that that's a terrible, terrible thing to have. That being said. Uh, I drove from Austin to San Antonio yesterday, which is like an hour and 45-minute drive. And on that drive, I saw no less than two traffic fatalities. Oh, totally. Oh, and I, I've been to yeah. Texas, and I've lived all over the country. You people drive terribly in Texas. You people? <laughs> 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 no man, uh, no. It's well, and part of the problem in in Texas, for real, is that uh, I, there is no other state that drives the the size of vehicles that we drive. Like there are SUVs and and and, and ginormous trucks, and I mean even the hybrid cars are large SUV cars. Uh, and so there's a lot of people from uh, my wife is from uh, New England, the, the Northeast area, uh, from Virginia, and. And yeah, when she came here, she had this little tiny boxy car, and she had to get an SUV just so she didn't get bossed around on the road. I mean, you you have to have a large oh, totally. car, which yeah. is part of the reason why I think that there are <laughs> there's just there are there happens to be a lot of accidents here. Uh, but anyway, I, I just want to say this: that yes, uh, flying statistically is still exceptionally more safer than than driving. Two. Those planes go through so many safety checks. Uh, again, unfortunately, this engine failed, and that sucks. The plane still landed safely, which I think is an important note. Uh, but they uh, they do. They go through so many safety checks. Humans do not take as good of care of their cars as you do as they do of planes. Like for example, my brakes were starting to squeak and squeal and stuff like that. I was like, ah, they still got another couple hundred <laughs> miles in them before I have to do anything. Uh, that sh- doesn't happen on an airplane. On an airplane, they're like, "Hey, that that light is on. We got to change that before this plane can fly." <laughs> uh, and if people, I've, pe- I've had a, I've had a pilot. Sorry to cut you off. I had no, a pilot. He like does the walk around, and then delays us by you know an hour. And he comes on the speaker. He's like, "Well, this this didn't look right, but you know what? Safety is our first concern." And I'm just sitting there going, "Yeah, I agree with you, but also." This should have been taken care of two hours ago. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I got, I got. We uh, we took my wife's car to San Antonio, and uh, it started to sprinkle on us on us a little bit. And I turned on her windshield wipers, and both of her windshield wipers, the rubber was completely loose and just flapping around <laughs> like that. And I thought to myself about this plane thing. I was like, man, if this is a plane. That's an hour delay while they change the windshield wipers before they take off. Didn't I but, recommend yeah. a badass uh, set of wiper blades on a Monday Club podcast a while ago? I think you did. I think I, think I did. You, I think you did, man. Yeah, we, yeah, should, yeah. we should shout out to, though, uh, the the pilot, uh, uh, Tammy Jo Schultz. She was a I, – I think she was the first – woman uh, fighter pilot for the military the u.s military and she now sl- flies for southwest and she uh 
handled the the landing, the emergency landing, calm and cool. Because you know why? She was in the uh, Air Force, and there was people trying to kill her with bullets and missiles. So. Yeah, yeah. So one one engine gone, no worries. Yeah, yeah. Holy! Crap. I like that people still don't say like. There's still like a lack of respect for pilots. I notice because traveling, like nobody really gives them the respect they kind of deserve of oh hey you're controlling this amazing metal bird in the sky with 200 lives on it and everybody's like all right thanks see ya <laughs> there's no like there's, like, yeah. there's a lack of respect missing yeah i mean i told I, I always thank the pilots and crew when i leave a plane because they totally uh, had my life in their hands so i'm gonna thank them but uh technically yeah. uh, airplanes aren't really flying like 95 percent of the time they land and they fly all with autopilot and the they're actually required to land manually a certain number of times every month or whatever each pilot is supposed to so they don't forget how to manually land and i was i was listening to an um uh, an interview with a pilot about it and they're like yeah you know the soft landings that you feel when you you know you barely know that you touch the ground that's when you can tell it's on autopilot <laughs> <laughs> you ever hit the ground really hard? Yeah, that was that was one of the uh, required manual landings. <laughs> That's funny. Well, uh, one of the things... there's a there's a fun. I don't know if you watch this show, um, Thirty Rock, but there's uh-huh. an episode with Matt Damon. He plays a pilot, and he's getting into an argument with his girlfriend Liz Lemon at the time. And he goes, you know, they're on a plane. He's like, you know what? Good luck. Good luck hitting autopilot for takeoff, fly, and land. You know, just like showing how impressive his skills are. <laughs> I can't wait till cars are like that. That'll be wonderful. Oh, God. Me too. Jesus. Uh, so one of the other things I want to point out on this, there's a lot of footage that came out with people. Of course, you're about to – you're in a, a high-stress emergency situation. The yellow – cup things with oxygen have popped down and everyone pulls out their cell phone and starts live streaming it or videotaping it uh, to their loved ones because that's what you do in this day and age um but one of the things i love that was pointed out by a bunch of a bunch of late night hosts and and news anchors everywhere is that people were having the yellow cup come down and they're just putting it over their mouth not their nose and all of the flight attendants are like you Holes. We do a briefing on this every goddamn time. It doesn't just go over your goddamn mouth. Like, it just... uh, <laughs> have you ever had the cups come you know, down in a flight? Is... I haven't. No. Nick, you ever have a cup? I had no. cups come down in a flight before. I was, uh, what was going from like? Baltimore to somewhere. It was. Uh, it was crazy. I was sleeping. I was in a dead sleep, and then all of a sudden, I hear over the intercom, "Please put on," you know. Please put on your masks. And it sounded like Darth Vader telling, giving me instructions because the pilot had his mask on too. And uh, <clears throat> and the uh, flight attendants were going up and down with their masks, and they had a the the mobile mask system. And I'm like waking up out of a stupor, and I don't know where I. I don't even know I'm on a plane for a second. I'm like, where the heck am I? And then this metal this cup is floating in my face. I'm like, what the heck is going on? And you know, like it took me. It felt like it took me a minute to figure out how to work the straps, um, <laughs> yeah, but I, I got them on, and uh, yeah, it was it was a little scary. And my first instinct was, of course, to take a picture for Instagram. But uh, yeah, yeah, and there, it, it was really nothing. There was some sort of sensor problem, and we had to go back to Baltimore. But yeah, it was it was a little scary. You're like, what what's going yeah. on? This is this is uh, this is not normal. So it's Nick, always on the a- one thing I I forget about that 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 that's an option you know you see that safety briefing briefing it a hundred times and you're like oh yeah we would we could lose oxygen and not be able to breathe you know the basic necessity of life but i'm going to keep watching my television program <laughs> <laughs> right right it, like you said this at the top of this at the top of the segment but we all really do forget that we're in a giant multi-ton metal sky dragon and you would think <laughs> that that would Make us care about safety. I mean, look, you're in a p- giant piece of metal that it would take two cranes to lift, and uh, you you you're more concerned about Flappy Bird than you are about anything else. <laughs> it seems like your your priorities are really jacked, man. <laughs> oh man! So I want to tell you this, Nick. Uh, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Meadows, was on a plane. I was asking him about uh, the like turbulence and the and the mass coming down and he's like yeah i was on a plane one time that the, we hit such rough turbulence that the mass came down which of course 
rough turbulence and the mass coming down, everybody's freaking out. And then the pilot or the the flight attendant got on the the mic and said, "If you have a drink, I want you to pour it out into the aisle. Just pour your drink out into the aisle." Which uh, I'm sure freaked everybody out even more, but in hindsight, makes total sense. It's like, look, if the plane's bouncing all over the place, your neighbor doesn't need to get sp- splashed with a rum and coke. Like, just pour it out. <laughs> let's let's we'll deal with the mess later. But let's uh, let's get through this rough patch real quick. So, uh, yeah, you know what they've they've seen tops to cup. I'm doing a Seinfeld bit now. They've seen tops to cups. They know they exist. But they still don't give them to you. Like, we know what straws are. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, the shakiest of all things. Now we're going to give you just this open cup, tiny That's... cup with lots of ice, filled to the top. <laughs> oh, I'm going to write that now. Thanks, That's... Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. I'm glad you, <laughs> I'm glad you got some out of this. <laughs> What's the deal with airplane water? <laughs> well, Gus, the summer movie challenge has begun. So yeah. for those of you catching up, Nick, we are doing a summer movie challenge where we went through like a ton of movies last week and uh, we predicted what their Rotten Tomatoes score would be. And uh, we're going to see who wins, who is closest towards the end. Uh, have uh, So we'll give you a chance to guess. So Super Troopers just came out this past week and... Uh, uh, we uh, Super Troopers won to give you a, a guide, uh, scored 35% on Rotten Tomatoes. Would you like to wager a guess as to what Super Troopers 2 is currently at on Rotten Tomatoes? Uh, 13%. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's personally offensive. I love that movie. <laughs> no, I, no, I love a lot of movies that oh. have terrible you know ratings yeah well here here's the before you say this pete uh here's the thing nick uh i i happen to have loved super troopers one and i uh i thought that super troopers two would be sitting at a fat 49 percent uh which is uh more than 10 points higher there 10 percent higher than uh super troopers the original pete put it at 39 percent you got it you said uh 13 percent not even 14 percent uh I'll tell you what, if we were going by Price is Right rules, you'd be winning because Super Troopers yes. 2 is sitting at 35% right now on Rotten oh. Tomatoes. So, uh, I, it's not bad. Yeah, I, it's I, not bad. It's right even with Super Troopers 1, so I guess I'm going to love the movie. Yeah. I, I, still have, I still have to go see yeah. it. And uh, so, okay, so we, uh, last week we also forgot one movie, and that is Venom. Uh, which is coming out this summer, I think in August, towards the end of the summer. Okay. I think. So just, I yeah, think uh, we. Yeah, uh, I'm. I'm really interesting to see. Uh, interested to see where they take it. Uh, Venom. I think I'm gonna go. I think it's gonna be really great. Uh, I'm gonna go 92 percent. Damn, Pete. 92 percent. Okay. I saw the trailers. It looks badass. Uh, I saw the trailers too, and in the trailers, I saw that they haven't gotten around to paying for CG yet. So, uh, it like had <laughs> everything but them showing off, uh, Venom. Uh, so I'm gonna put it at uh, 61. 61 Whoa, okay. On Rotten Tomatoes. And just for fun, Nick, you, you want to throw one yeah, out, Nick? I don't know. That one's a toughie. Um, that could be a Suicide Squad, or that could be a, a great film. So, I don't know. Uh I'll say 72. All right. We'll mark it down and uh we'll we'll add we'll talk about it when it happens. Yeah, we'll let you know. Uh I I like that you compared great movies to every like great movies on one side and Suicide Squad <laughs> to the other. <laughs> that's, that's that's your that's your I scale. Mean, I watched the first 20 minutes on a ship one day and I was like, oh, "I'm done with this." But maybe it gets better. Maybe it was a great film and it I'm just missing out. No, no, okay. no, it really doesn't. Yeah, no. It, I'm it sure actually, there's a lot of DC people that will be very angry at me for saying that, but that's my opinion. Nope. No, they won't. <laughs> well, Nick, dude, uh, we uh, we look, here's the deal, man. We know you're a badass. You, you do cruise ships. You've done the Magic Castle. Uh, uh, obviously, you're, you're successful at what you do. You're living in L.A. That's awesome. Uh, l- let me ask you this, bro. Uh, tell me a time where everything went completely wrong. Oh, this always comes to mind. This was a corporate event, which I'm sure you guys know very well. Um, giant room, probably three to 400 people in. 
they had me on a tiny stage at the very end of the room. Uh, didn't have a mic for me. You know, they had one of those podiums. <laughs> I think I brought my headset mic or was able to plug in, but this was like when I was still kind of new to um, corporate events. So I was still getting my feel. This is like 2011. So I'm still I've been doing magic for 15 years, but corporate events, I'm, it wasn't until then where I was really starting to get the hang of it. Anyway, I do it. It's just failing. Everything's going terrible. Um, everything's going wrong. I get a book test wrong. I get a, a word wrong on a book test that I've done forever. Everybody's talking the whole time. And, uh, you, you know, you end the show with that, that classic joke. It's one of the few stock lines I actually use. Uh, you know, if you like me, my name's Nick Paul. If you don't like me, my name is Chris Angel. Uh -huh. you take a bow. You walk off. And some... I don't know if he was with the company or somebody comes up, starts giving a speech and goes, all right, thank you, Chris Angel. Um, and usually people will say that kind of ironically or joke, hey, thanks, Chris, you know, after the show. But, you know, they have a smile on their face. This uh -huh. guy was serious. He, oh, no. He hated me. <laughs> and so it's like, all right, that was awful. I knew I, it felt awful. I knew it was bad. But here's the kicker is I all my stuff was still on stage and I couldn't leave through the back of the room because that was a kitchen. I had to drag all of my stuff through this giant ballroom by myself for an audience that just hated me. <laughs> oh, and no. I had to make like three trips. So it wasn't just once. I had to go <laughs> back and forth. Just simultaneously going, all right, bye. I'm sorry. Bye. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. I apologize. <laughs> Um, oh, apologizing yeah, to was, the audience. It was bad news. <laughs> oh, man. I feel I literally for you. called up my mentor on the oh, ride home. I, I called up my mentor on the ride home, and I'm like, um, when, when, when do you know you're supposed to quit this business? Because I feel like I just had the gig that's telling me to quit <laughs> right now. So it was, it was pretty intense. Oh, dude, that's one, that's brutal. Two, uh, I think we've all been there. So, you know, no worries, man. We've all gone through that. Uh, and three, I'm going to raise my glass to you, sir, because that, uh, that's rough, bro. That's rough. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out of coffee, but I'll raise my glass too. Uh, hey, it's time for Stories from the Road. Kind of got a sneak peek into one right there. That was a good story. Um, so <laughs> I've been on the road a little bit. Uh, I was in Virginia, uh, and I got to meet up with my cousin, Amanda, who lives in Virginia. I actually had a show in her town, which just reminded me that's the best part of traveling is you get to see like people you don't get to see around the country. Uh, and that was awesome. Got to go to this little brewery restaurant and tried some uh, local brews, which were fantastic. Uh, it was in... Uh, Manassas, Virginia, I believe. Uh, I can't remember nice, the restaurant. Beautiful. Otherwise, Historic. I'd totally plug them. And then I was in Alabama for a couple days. Uh, I did uh, my show, Magician for Nonbelievers, and then I did Summoning Spirits. And uh, uh, <laughs> at one of the schools before the show, uh, I was told that the uh, Christian group on campus was going to picket my show. <laughs> yes! <laughs> Yes. That's great. Yeah. And apparently they didn't like the title Summoning Spirits. And uh, I I got, <laughs> at first I got really excited. Uh, I was like, oh my God, notch in my belt. I've been wanting this for years. And then I got really oh, nervous. Man. I'm like, oh no, what if, what if, I don't, you know, I don't want conflict. I don't want to be in an argument. I don't, you know, and, uh, but it turns out uh, they chose not to come uh, and protest the show, uh -huh. uh, which I was slightly disappointed, but slightly relieved at the same time. And uh, we had a full house and the show went great. And uh, I found spring down there and brought it back to Maine. So it was wonderful. It was, it was a win. It was a win-win trip. Nice. I was hoping they nice. were going to be out there picketing, and then you brought them all up on stage and did card tricks for them or something. <laughs> <laughs> or turned water into wine, perhaps. <laughs> I should add that in. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, just ch you could change their religion. That'd be so – that that's that'd be on a website somewhere. That'd be great. Uh <laughs> Uh, well, uh, so this week I was touring through uh, Louisiana. I had a couple shows in Louisiana, and I uh, went in Louisiana, uh, go to the Louisiana casinos because they are they smell of desperation, and for twenty five bucks you can have a really good time. And so I sat down. Are you sure that's at a, a casino? 
No. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a massage parlor. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, anyway, I I went to this. Uh, I went to. Uh, God, was it was it Harris? I think it was Harris in in uh, in Louisiana, in uh, just outside of Bossier in Shreveport, Louisiana. Sat down, had a cigar, and played some video blackjack. Now, I want to say first and foremost that video blackjack is probably the most desperate thing that any human being can do. There's no human interaction. They have uh, very scantily clad. Uh, video vixens that are dealing blackjack uh and i was sitting at a at a video blackjack thing by myself so i felt super skeevy that being said i was smoking a cigar and didn't want to have cigar smoke go into people's faces so i was trying to be respectful thing number two i realized that this last experience gambling that i have probably Probably I'd have a little bit of a gambling problem because I had set aside like 50 bucks to just sit back and enjoy my cigar and and play a little blackjack. And I finished that 50 bucks and I hadn't quite finished my cigar. And I was like, (laughs) oh, well, I can dip in a little bit more and and just kept going more and more and more to the point where I had dipped a little past where I was happy going. And I was like, oh, man. Now I, I definitely have a problem, and then I hit a blackjack and got $65 and, and basically only had lost 40 and it was like, it's time to leave. Uh, but I wanted to tell you, uh, that r- spun it off to, there was one time when I was in, I was in Vegas. I was, I was there for my bachelor party uh, at one point in time, and I had, I had just gone through all of the money that I had for my Vegas party, and I still had like two days left in Vegas, and I was like, man... Damn it, that was all my gambling money. And I was just sitting down, I was finishing a cocktail, and I looked, and underneath one of the machines was a $50 bill. It was just sitting there. And I was like, whoa, somebody dropped a 50. And I watched it for like two minutes, just looking around, and nobody claimed it. So I walked up to the machine, and I sat down, and I put my foot on it, and I sat there for another five minutes, <laughs> and nobody claimed it. And I was like, hell yeah. So I reached down and picked it up. I was like, woohoo, I got 50 bucks. Woohoo! And then I was like, well, this 50 bucks, man, I've never played a $25 slot machine. So I go over to the $25 <laughs> slot machine and I put it in oh, and no. one one pull later and it's all gone. And I was like, I have oh, a problem. Geez. I definitely <laughs> I definitely have a problem. <laughs> oh man. Well, you never had the money to begin with, so I guess it evens out. Yeah, 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 exactly. It was, it was I was I was it wasn't really a win. It was basically like, hey, this is this is 50 bucks for you to see uh, see if you can become a millionaire. So <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's what I did this weekend was uh, shows in Louisiana and uh, you know, hit a little bit of gambling. Nick, what about you, man? What have you been up to this week? I know you just got off a cruise ship. Um, yeah, I got in in Orlando. Um, got off. Uh, stopped in Mexico. Got off in Jamaica. Um, spent two hours in Jamaica and flew to Miami. Then came back to L.A. And that was like two years ago. That would stress me out. Just all the movement and transfers and whatnot. <laughs> but it, it, everything went remarkably on time and it's kind of like i'm learning just to be in a zen state of mind when i travel now of just like eh, whatever happens is gonna happen and just like little things like my wife was we went through customs and my wife saw that there was an ad for mobile passport i kind of don't want to give this away but if you do go through customs and you're not global entry um download the mobile passport app and you can just like quickly take a photo of yourself say where you've been and you show it and you like literally walk right through immigration or mm-hmm. customs, whatever it is. And um, so that saved like an hour. <laughs> and we just like got our bags, got back on the plane, connected back to L.A. And it was like the easiest travel day ever. And I'm like, oh, I was just in Jamaica three hours ago. Right. Um, it's just it's kind of funny how sometimes everything works super efficiently. And then there's other days where kind of like going back to the plane thing of all these things just fall apart in <laughs> You circle Detroit for three hours because there's a uh, a storm, and then your plane runs out of gas, so you have to get rerouted <laughs> to Chicago, and right. then you land in Chicago, and the pilot's out of flight time, so they have to call a new pilot. This is all things that happened to be in to happen to us in August. That was a fun day. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and then other times it's like super efficient and it worked great. So it it was a good good travel week. 
Oh, that's good, man. That's cool. Hey, uh, so I wanted to ask you a quick uh, cruise ship question. Uh, while you're on cruise ships, do you find that you try to spend some time outside of your room? Or once you're done with your show, do you pretty much barricade yourself into the room? Um, it depends if the show went well. <laughs> <laughs> The show went well. I'll go out and say hi to people. And you know um, that if people are calling you, good... you Chris? <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. And, like, there, I was talking about this with my buddy Scott Pepper, who I, I did the castle with last week. He also does ships. Um, he started off on Disney. And um, we, we just talk about just, like, you know the show went well if people talk to you a certain way. They talk to you as if you're a celebrity, like, very polite and, oh, we really uh-huh. enjoyed that. Can we get a photo with you? Or if they didn't really get the show or they really didn't care, they'd be like, hey, there's the magician over there. And, like, they don't even call your name. They just – they point at you as if you're some sort of zoo animal at the buffet line and you're <laughs> you're literally five feet from them. Right. Um, so – it kind of just depends, you know, if, if it's a, if it's a good week or if it's, if it good, if it's a good set of shows, I don't, I love going out. Um, and it gives, gives me a, a sense thought... of what it's like to be a celebrity. It's weird. Yeah. Well, that's cool. I always thought a, a cruise magi- uh, performer, magician should always write a book living with your audience. <laughs> that's yeah. A great yeah. Title. yeah you, you don't get to leave. It's Disney's nice. Cause it's only like four or five day contract but other ship i've done 14 days on a ship and it's Damn. like oh boy get me out of here <laughs> i'd feel so claustrophobic for that long and be like ah, i just want to get off and do something else yeah yeah no yeah, joke. It's, it's an acquired taste <laughs> all right gentlemen teachable, teachable moments. moments you know we didn't even have to uh pitch uh <laughs> these sound effects pitch. keep that getting completely... better and better by the way yeah, yeah. Uh, no Pro Tools there. That was great. So my teachable <laughs> moment uh, is you're gonna. You guys are probably gonna hate me for this teachable moment. You're gonna disagree with me. You're gonna think I'm crazy. The restaurant Golden Corral. That's my teachable moment. <laughs> Look, when I was down in Alabama, they're everywhere, and so they're super cheap lunch buffet, ten bucks all you can eat. And I've just recently started being a vegetarian. Uh, so finding a place, even like Panera Bread has terrible vegetarian options. It's like a quinoa bowl and just mm-hmm. black bean soup and that's it. But uh, <laughs> And bread. But, and yeah, so much bread. You just end up eating bread all the time. But Golden Corral, they have like potatoes. They have everything. They White have... gravy, brown gravy, corn, a chocolate fountain, D- asparagus. Yes. Everything. Yes. I ate like four <laughs> plates of vegetables and and I, I did indulge in some of those amazing biscuits they have. <laughs> and uh, it was it was pretty it was pretty freaking epic. I've been I went there like three times in two days. And if you eat late enough, like because their lunch buffet goes till four p.m., so if you eat say at like three, you pay ten bucks, but you're not even hungry until you go to bed, so you don't even have to eat dinner. <laughs> This is nice. <laughs> Cheapskate Pete right here. Uh, so, yeah, I, I kind of enjoyed myself there. That's awesome. All right, Golden Corral's on the road. Nick, you have a teachable moment for anybody listening? I don't know, man. Um, I think it was just going back to that cruise ship story of if somebody calls you and asks you to do something, just say yes to it because I think ultimately it ended, ended benefiting me um, because I, I'm sure – I'll get a good review just because I said yes and was able to help them out. And the cruise ship director and the assistant cruise dr- ship director were so thankful um, that I was able to s- step in. So if if you're able to help out with something, go for it. Well, uh, yeah, man. Uh, my teachable moment is uh, is this. Uh, this week on the road, I uh, I told you I was in Louisiana. Uh, one of the people on our uh, on our on our team uh, for to go events, uh, Miss Kim. Johnson made a really cool crocheted uh, item. It was a crocheted owl uh, for one of our clients as a gift just to, you know, and do some goodwill and she likes to crochet so she'd made it and I totally spaced and gave it to the wrong client and then had to go <laughs> back to the client uh, that I gave it to and be like, hey, I'm real sorry, that one's not for you. We're totally making you one right now but I gotta take that back to give it to the, the next school. Uh, so I felt like such an ass. I had the flop sweats going while I was stealing it back from her and I had to apologize and it was terrible uh so 
so so here's my teachable moment. Double check your clients' names before you talk to them, because <laughs> uh, you know you never know you might screw that up. So just don't go off of your memory. Always write that shit down and double check your clients' names. Uh, good idea. They might have you back then if you remember their names. <laughs> Not if you steal their cute little crocheted owl. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Well, Nick, thank you so much for being part of Monday Club. Uh, we really appreciate you being on. Is there? I know you can. Everyone can go to www.nickpaul.net to check out uh, what you do as a performer and also your podcast, Two Magicians One Mike. Is there anything else you want to plug while you're here? Yeah, just nickpaul.net and then two magicians one mike dot com. Um, yeah, check it out. If you're a performer, you hopefully will like it, and if you're not a performer, hopefully you'll like it too. But, yeah, thanks. This has been fun. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, Nick, thanks for being on, man. We appreciate you, buddy. All right, cool, man. Thanks, guys. What a Monday club it has been. Special thanks to Nick Paul. You can check him out at www.nickpaul.net. Of course, Monday Club at www.mondayclubpodcast.com. Facebook.com slash Monday Club Podcast. Twitter at Monday Club Pod. Instagram at Monday Club Podcast. Email us questions, comments, concerns, quibbles, quandaries at Monday Club Podcast at gmail.com. Special shout out to James Caldwell, our sound engineer. Thanks, buddy, for all your hard work. And Mr. Zach Holder for our music. Go out. Be merry, look at the sun, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>